Okay, hello, those who are here, those who are watching the video sometime in the future. <laughs> um, all right, so as usual, beginning with where we are in the book. So the doctrine of elements was divided into the transcendental aesthetic and the transcendental logic. And the transcendental logic is divided into the analytic and the dialectic. And uh, transcendental analytic has two parts, the analytic of concepts. Right, that was what contained the metaphysical deduction and the transcendental deduction, we finished that. And now we started the second part of the transcendental analytic, which is the analytic of principles. And last time, that is yesterday, <laughs> I talked about the first part, mostly the schematism. Um, so, oops. Today we're talking about the principles, and then after that we got to phenomena and noumena, which is the third part of the analytical principles. And um, um, Right, this is, maybe I should call this the system of principles. And I probably haven't left enough room here to write what goes in here, but I'll write it over here. Because the system of principles is divided into four parts and the four parts are organized according to the categories or the headings of the categories that is quantity quality relation modality right so the first part is sorry axioms of intuition the second part is anticipations of perception. That visible? Yes. Third part is analogies of experience. And the fourth part is the postulates of empirical thought in general. Um, and the reading for today was, um, well, um, first of all, within the analogies of experience, there's three analogies. So the reading for today was the second analogy of experience and the postulates of empirical thought in general. At least that's approximately, I think that was all the reading for today. <laughs> um, I guess also the introduction to the analogies or something like that. Um, So, um, so like, I mean, we're kind of skipping big parts of the system of principles, which is bad because it's a system, <laughs> right? So um, it's not good to read only part of it. Uh, however, there's only so much time in a quarter and, um, um, and I, you know, wouldn't want to teach this book without getting to the later parts, like the transcendental dialectic. Um, because as we saw from the preface, 
from some point of view, according to Kant, that's the most important part. <laughs> um, so, um, um, so I'll say something about why this, why I ch I chose to assign the second analogy in particular. Um, but before I get to that, I want to say something like about the overall structure here. Um, so first of all, like just to remind you of how things are supposed to work, at least according to me, like in the analytic of concepts, we showed that um, the manifold that's given an inner sense um, has to be, so to speak, an image of the categories, right? Like using the language that we have from the schematism, we can say that the transcendental imagination must be able to pro produce the manifold in inner sense as an image of the categories. Now, again, as always, I'm gonna say that talk about a priori faculties doing things a priori is metaphorical. Right, there wasn't an a priori time when that happened. It's we're we're talking about like the a priori certain possibility of the empirical imagination producing the empirical manifold and in inner sense as image of an empirical concept. But in abstraction from any knowledge about what the actual sensible content of of inner sense is right that is what is that i actually perceived or uh sensed i guess um and therefore in abstraction from uh like what in particular the imagination is going to do um so um and and that's what it means to say that like there's a transcendental, there's a faculty of transcendental imagination. That is the imagination of an object in general, an object of our faculties in general, right? Because at least as I argued that the imagination is specific to us. The imagination is a faculty that has to do with time. So it has to do with our form of inner sense, right? So um, the, the, that there's a transcendental imagination means that there's uh, you know a capability of imagination which must be in place prior to any particular actual empirical object being given. Um, okay, so that right that's what this was supposed to show that that the manifold of inner sense in general must be an image of the categories. And then the schematism is supposed to explain what that means in terms of, so what does it take to provide <clears throat> the manifold of inner sense as an image of each category, right? Dur during the course of the of the transcendental deduction, there's, except for, for, again, for a few examples, as usual, there's there's no discussion of the individual categories at all, right? It's, so it's only when we get to here that we start to learn what it means what we proved here, what the imagination has to be able to do. So the schematism is supposed to establish what the imagination has to be able to do. And then the highest principle of all synthetic judgments um, uh, like, so to speak, plugs that into the result of the deduction. They imagine, so the, the highest principle of all synthetic judgments is that, and to put it in the kind of negative way I was suggesting before, like you can't coherently deny that the manifold and in inner sense is such as to allow the uh, this unity of synthesis and therefore this synthesis that we've just explained in the schematism. So uh, the negation of all your attempts to deny it must be true. <laughs> um, and then when we go to the system of principles, we're supposed to be working out in detail to show exactly what it is that we can't deny, or in other words, must maintain about the manifold and inner sense. Um, and, you know, that explains why the principles have to be 
organized according to the categories. Because the principles are just going through the, just as the schemata have to be organized according to the categories, because the schemata are the schemata of the categories. And then the principles are derived from the fact that we must be able to apply the schemata. So there's one principle per category or, and as I said, really it kind of, it goes in this weird way that there's one principle for the category of quantity one for the category of quality. And then, well, actually, so in the analogies, it's kind of a hybrid. There's like a, there's an overall principle of all the analogies of experience at the beginning. And then there's three sub principles, right? One for substance and accident, one for cause and effect, and one for community. Um, and then when we get to the postulates, there's just three postulates, one for possibility, one for actuality or existence, and one for necessity. Um, now, um, um, When I say the principles are in the order of the categories, I don't know if I've emphasized that this year as much as I should have, that the categories have an order, right? Like quantity is the first category. Um, uh, Kant doesn't really say why there's that order anywhere, but he does, but it's always the same order, or if it isn't, then he makes a remark why we do it in a different order here, right? So we'll see that, for example, the paralogisms, where he starts with the category of relation or substance. Um, and then he says, oh, we don't go in the usual order because blah, blah, blah. The explanation is hard to understand, but whether you understand it or not, the fact that there's an explanation means that there's a usual order and you need an explanation when you leave the usual order, right? So, I mean, uh, um, I think I could explain, but I'm not going to stop to try to explain, you know, should I? I mean, I think the order of the three, so here's the categories again, in case you don't remember. Quantity, quality, relation, modality. And then within each one of these, there's three moments. And I have talked about the order of those moments, right? And uh, in our text in the B edition, Kant at least says that the third moment is always a combination of the first two, right? Meaning that they're definitely, he's recognizing the third moment as like, there's each one has a third moment that means there's some kind of order to it but i think that the first two are also in order and i've talked about that how they have the, the order is well it's the order of the neoplatonic moments of permanence progression and reversion <laughs> um or of the convertible transcendentals of um one true and good as kant describes them um so uh, um, so there's an or so once you have an order of these, you also have an order of all twelve if you want, right? This, 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 etc. So what about the order of these? Well, I mean, there's different ways of dividing these. I think if you look at my, uh, maybe I should share my screen. Um. I have to find the right thing to share. Mm. 
What's going to happen if I do this now? We'll see. Oops, that's the wrong thing. That's the right thing. Let's see what happens. All right. Um, right. So this was this was this is my table of categories that like you can find as a bonus on the like this. You can find it here. Table of categories. Okay. Um, so uh right so one way of dividing all that 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 already shows a kind of order to them is this division kant makes between mathematical and dynamical quantity and quality are mathematical categories relation and modality are dynamical categories um uh, in the A edition, he actually first starts talking about that around now, but in the B edition, he inserted a discussion of it already way back after he introduced the categories. Um, so, I mean, that's important and interesting and comes back in a number of cases, but there's another way of dividing them, which is that what I've written over here, that these three categories are real determinations of the object. Whereas the category of modality is not. The category of modality is about the relation between the object and the faculty of knowledge or cognition. So I actually think that this order that goes across here of three moments is also repeated twice in the in this vertical direction in my table now i mean remember again the horizontal and vertical directions are, are a feature of my table this isn't the way kant writes it right he writes it in this weird diamond shape <laughs> but um but just to talk about my table it has a vertical direction so like up here i put the convertible transcendentals that kant says are, are merely subjective and in the transcendental deduction, he refers back to this transcendental unity when he introduces the transcendental unity of apperception, right? So if you thought that the discussion of uh, convertible transcendentals was only an interesting footnote about medieval philosophy, I think that reference back to it in the transcendental deduction says, no, it's something really important, actually. <laughs> um, so you have these subjective you have these subjective moments, you have these objective moments, and then you have the moments of the relation of the object back to the subject. So this, again, is this relation of permanence, procession, reversion, or uh, Hegelian terms like immediacy, difference, and uh, um, reflection. Not sure what I should call the third one. Anyway, reflection into self. <laughs> um, right. So, but I think also within these objective moments, you also kind of have the same order. Right. This is about like quantity is about the respect in which all uh, experience is more and more of the same. It's the category of the synthesis of the homogeneous, as Kant says. Um, quality is about the respect in which uh, the manifold in experience is different from itself, right? It differs, different times and spaces are the same in quantity, but they differ in quality. For example, they have different density of matter in them. Um, and then this is somehow about the spatio-temporal relation of these different qualitative states to each other. Um, okay, so I don't know. Anyway, I don't want to uh, push that too hard, except I probably already have spent more time on that than I should have. But um, but I, I, I just, I mean, if you take anything away from that, it's the, like, there does seem to be an order here, and it's, and it's, and it's, not one that it seems like it's hopeless to explain. I think you can, and I think Kant says things about it in various places that you can put together. Um, 
So, um, but I'm introducing that here mainly to point out that that order carries over into the principles in the sense that when we begin talking about any principle, we assume the conclusions of the previous ones. Right, so like for example, in the anticipations of perception, um, um, so the conclusion of the anticipations of perception is that the, the reality of anything is an intensive quantity or quantum. Right, so that um, what's an example of that, like mass? Right, like mass is a um, is a character that something has that makes it the thing it is rather than something else. It's a qualitative character, um, but it's a matter of degree. You can have more or less of it. It's a matter of continuous degree, right? So the anticipation of the perception is supposed to show that um, all reality in all objects is consists of things that are a matter of degree like that temperature mass you know illumination whatever things like that um but um in in the discussion and proof of that principle uh Kant assumes what was already proved in the axioms of intuition Namely, that the thing we're talking about is an extended quantum, right? So, like, it takes up some amount of space and can be measured off by units. We take that for granted, and then we try to show that what fills that space and is measured off by units must itself be a measure of in a matter of intensive quantity. It must be a matter of degree. Um, and um. And similarly, therefore, when we get to the analogies of experience, and so by the way, I should say, right, there's obviously two sequences here, axioms, anticipations, analogies, postulates. Kant says something to, to justify each of these, but these names, but it's not necessarily easy to understand exactly what they mean. I'm gonna say something about the meaning of analogy here. Um, this sequence is actually kind of easier to understand. Intuition, perception, experience, empirical thought in general. Um, at least these three, intuition, perception, experience, right? Like um, Kant says, uh, for example, at the beginning of the analogies that experience is always a matter of connected perceptions, perceptions that are related to each other. And a perception in turn is like um, an intuition with sensation. So it's uh, a, an, ex a, an extension that is filled with some sensible reality. That's the, that's what perception is about. Um, so that's why there's a sequence. This when he says intuition here, he means like mere intuition or pure intuition. Um, and that's why the axioms of intuition are the are the foundation underlying the foundation of mathematics, so to speak, according to Kant. I mean, mathematics itself is a matter of the form of pure intuition. It's discussed in the transcendental aesthetic, but, um, but the applicability of mathematics to objects rests on the, the proof that all the objects we find have to be extended quanta. Um, so, uh, which is what the axiom of intuition shows, but like that shows something about 
the purely geometrical properties of our objects or the purely mathematical properties of our objects, whether arithmetic or geometrical. Whereas the anticipation of the perception goes on to say something about how we're actually going to perceive them. And Kant says, that's surprising. How can we say in advance what sensations we'll, we're going to get? Isn't That's like the epitome of a posteriori. So actually, I think we we know from the from like some of Kant's notes from the silent decade that quality was the last category to be inserted. <laughs> like at first he didn't think he would need a category of quality. Right. But now he says, no, there is something we can say about them in advance. Not uh, not their quality as qualities, so to speak, but their quantitative nature as qualities, we can say in advance, they have to be a matter of degree. Right, like, um, these things together, um, boy, I'm going on too long about this, but I have to say at least this much, that the, these things together, and especially because this wasn't even part of the reading, right? So I'm just telling you what was there. <laughs> I mean, you're obviously welcome to read it. <laughs> um, but uh, these things together, among other things, are what establish the possibility of money, right? Like if you have any two things, you can compare them in quantity. <laughs> um, and sure enough, Kant discusses money as an example in the anticipations of perception, golden dollars or dollars, right? And that that example of money is going to come back in the discussion of transcendental theology. So keep that in mind. So it, it's not just an example, like in some way, like, yeah, this is what makes it possible for any sensible thing to have a finite price. Um, so in Marx's discussion of price, he starts off by assuming that and doesn't explain how we know that. So I mentioned this to a friend of mine who's a uh, Marxist, and he said, well, yeah, because Kant's like proof here is just a like bourgeois superstructure. Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> So I guess it depends how you look at it, who goes deeper. Anyway, getting back to Kant, right. So um, um, so the schemata and the principles and the, the categories and the schemata and the principles are all in a certain order. And when we get to the analogies, we're assuming that we're... Um, that we're dealing with these like quantitative objects. And the analogy shows something about the relationship there has to be between different quantities. Um, so like the, and the, the first analogy, which again, wasn't part of the assigned reading, the analogy of substance shows that there must be some quantity that's conserved. That's the quantity of substance. So, I mean, a substance, like, from Aristotelian point of view, if you ask, give an example of a substance, you'd probably say, well, like, Bucephalus. Alexander the Great's horse is a substance. Um, and, I mean, that is, it is the Aristotelian concept of substance that Kant is kind of trying to explain here. So, you know, I mean, there's two things about the substance according to Aristotle. One is that it's the ultimate subject of all predication. So everything is said about a substance and the substance isn't said about or of anything else. And the other is that it's the permanent substrate of change, right? So Bucephalus can change color or size or whatever, but it remains the same because the substance remains. So, I mean, Kant is saying that, but 
now the substance is being the, the thing that stays the same is being understood as a certain quantity of reality of some kind. And I mean, should you think of it as a lot of teeny little substances? Each one of us, each one of which exists forever and always maintains its own quantity? Or should you think of it as one continuous substance that, um, you know, has an overall quantity, but uh, like as its density changes in one place or another, that quantity can like flow around. It's just the total that has to be conserved. Um, right, so, um, by the way, Newton says that mass is the quantity of matter. So, you know, which is it? Well, I think um, this is actually, uh, um, again, not one we're going to be reading, <laughs> but uh, um, this is one of the, what are called the antinomies in the transcendental dialectic. Whether there, whether or not there are simple substances in experience, and antinomies are, are are cases where Kant says you can prove both sides, and yet they contradict each other. So what went wrong? And he says, well, what wrong is you tried to apply the categories outside the realm of possible experience. So in other words, that, that question I just asked, like, should you think of this as little individual substances, each one of which conserves its own quantity and is simple, or should you think of it so that if density increases, it's just because more of these come together, right? Or should you think of it as one continuous substance that doesn't have simple parts and its overall quantity is conserved? And the answer I think to Kant is that's a bad, according to Kant is that's a bad question. We can't answer that question. <laughs> okay, so, but leaving that aside, so, we're so the first analogy shows that the quantity of substance is always the same. And the only thing that changes is its state. Um, so, I mean, what should we think in terms of changing its state? I mean, the, the most obvious thing to think, um, and like, this is how Spinoza discusses the state of modes of extension. Um, it's, I guess it's the way mechanists think about it in general, that, that you should think of its state as its state of motion. So the quantity of the substance remains the same, but its state of motion changes. Now, I think, I guess Kant is thinking of it that way. Oh, that's a little weird because, because the total momentum is also conserved, right? So in a sense, the motion doesn't change anymore. The state of motion doesn't change any more than the mass. <laughs> um, but I don't know, anyway. Um, so, um, so, uh, so that's what the first analogy has shown. And so by the time we come to the second analogy, we know like what we're trying to show is something about, um, um, what kind of principle in a substance must be present to explain a change in state of some substance. That's the that's the specific version of the law of cause and effect that we're trying to show. That the 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 quantity of substance remains the same, but the quantity of their their states changes, and that's when event that's an event is a change in the quantity of the state of some substance, and um, that must be explained by a pre-existing principle in some substance. So, I mean, okay, 
So, uh, like, I'm just arguing basically even more strongly why it's bad to skip any part of the system of principles because it's actually like in order, right? So it's uh, like, uh, um, if if you're if you skip some part, so I, I just kind of helped fill in some of what we're skipping. But if you if you skip some parts, then you don't quite understand what we're taking for granted when we get to the later parts. Um, um, and I guess I want to emphasize that not just to make you feel bad that I didn't assign the whole system of principles, but um, but also because there, you know, there have been and I guess continue to be people who read the system of principles as a kind of bag of arguments. Right, so you just like take each argument and try to figure it out and make objections to it and whatever. And they and without realizing that it's part of a continuous train. <laughs> um, okay, well, I mean, One result of, of everything I've just been saying, though, is that in a way, reading the postulates gives you an overview of what already happened. Um, so, Ray, like, these three are about what, um, What's the right way to say this? Yeah, I mean, these three are about what the object of experience must be like, what nature must be like. The postulates are about how nature must be related to, to us, to our thought in general. Um, and therefore the postulates, um, are kind of like about all of these again. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, he actually says this, if you pay attention, so, um, oops, not that. The postulates of empirical thought in general. By the way, I should say so in general, tran here translates the German word überhaupt. It's not a bad translation of it. I don't know if there's a good translation of it, really. It's it's hard to translate into English. But I mean, I guess more informally, you could say it means something like period, thought, period, right? Like it's thought in general in the sense that it's just like, just thought without further specifying. All right, so the same can be asserted of the postulates of empirical thought in general which concern the synthesis of mere intuition, that is, of the form of appearance, of perception, that is, of the matter of perception, and of experience, that is, of the relation of these perceptions. Right, so that's supposed to be a list of the three postulates of empirical thought in general. But it's also clearly a list of the three uh, parts of the system of principles we, that we went through before the postulates, right? The synthesis of mere intuition, that's the axioms of intuition, which concern the form of appearance, right? Again, they're about mere intuition, the merely formal 
properties of the objects of experience. Of perception, right? So that's about the anticipations of perception. That is of the matter of perception. And of experience, that's the analogies of experience. That is of the relation of these perceptions, right? And sure enough, if you turn ahead to the postulates, um, let's notes. Oh, oh, sorry. The refutation of idealism is in the middle of postulates. I don't know what I was thinking. All right, here we go. Here are the postulates. Okay. The postulates of empirical thought in general, the first postulate, that is the postulate of possibility. So remember the three moments of modality. Um, back to the floor for a second. Right, the three moments of modality. So the postulates, the, the fourth part of the system corresponds to modality. The three moments of modality are possibility, um, actuality, or being, and, and necessity. So the first postulate says, that which agrees with the formal conditions of experience, that is, with the conditions of intuition and of concepts, is possible. That which is bound up, the second postulate, the postulate of actuality says, that which is bound up with the material conditions of experience, that is, with sensation, is actual. Sensation is the material condition of experience because the matter of experience is the object of experience, and sensation is the effect of the object. Right, so what this postulate is saying is what I kind of um, said last time, that is yesterday, that you know we have principles of po of possibility, or in other words, of impossibility. Right, that is, we can rule out certain things and say they couldn't be true because they violate the highest principle of all analytic judgments, or because they violate the highest principle of all synthetic a priori judgments. But we don't have a positive principle of, that allows us to derive what things are true, except for the special case of the negation of things that would violate those principles, right? Um, but in general, we don't have a positive principle that allows us to determine what is actually true. So what determines what's actually true? The object. The principle in the object determines what's actually true, and um, and the um, our access to that is through its effect on us. That is sensation, right? So that's what this postulate is saying about actuality. That which is bound up with the material conditions of experience, that is with sensation, is actual, meaning actuality is not something I derive from myself the way an intuitive intellect is. Actuality is something I have to wait to be given by the object. So this is about actuality, um, and that's why it's in the postulates, but it's also about um, sensation that is... Um, uh, the thing that perception has that mere intuition doesn't. So it's also about perception, as Kant said in that other place I was reading to you. And then that which in its connection with the actual is determined in accordance with universal conditions of experience is, that is, exists as necessary. So this is about the relation of perceptions. That is, it's about experience.
Um, Right, and that's also why Kant says this is the postulates don't exactly have a uh, proof. They have what Kant calls an explanation, and I think this is his his explanation for why <laughs> they don't have a proof, but rather an explanation. Just on this account, also the principles of modality. So, on what account? On on account that this is where he he says explicitly what I've been saying all along about the categories of modality. The categories of modality have the peculiarity, peculiarity that in determining an object, they do not in the least enlarge the concept to which they are attached as predicates. They only express the relation of the concept to the faculty of knowledge. Even when the concept of a thing is quite complete, I can still inquire whether this object is merely possible or is also actual, or if actual, whether it is not also necessary. Right, so again, they're not real determinations or predicates of the object. When I say that something is possible or actual or necessary, I'm not adding to the description of the object, but I'm adding something about its relationship to my faculty. And we just saw what the three things I'm adding are, <laughs> right? I won't go through it again, but this I, this also will come back when we get to the transcendental ideal. That is the part on transcendental theology and the dialectic. Okay, but anyway, so just on this account also, the principles of modality are nothing but explanations of the concepts of possibility, actuality, and necessity in their empirical employment, right? So they're not like, um, unlike the other principles, um, I don't know what the right way to say this. Maybe you say, unlike the other principles, they don't seem to say anything new. And therefore, they don't require a proof. But because they just say what possibility, actuality, and necessity mean for us. I mean... It's a little weird because it seems like there could be principles here. Um, like the object of every empirical concept, properly formed empirical concept is possible. And it's actual because it's an empirical concept. <laughs> And it's relatively necessary because it had some cause. And given that cause, it was necessary. Um, but there's there, um, there aren't principles like that here. There's just explanations of what it what possibility, actuality, and necessity mean for us. And then, but he's saying, so, and those actually, well, they don't seem to say anything new, actually are synthetic. That is, they, they have a special content. And what is their content? At the same time, they restrict all categories to their merely empirical employment and do not approve or allow their transcendental employment. Right, so those statements of what actuality, po possibility, actuality, and necessity mean for us are a way of um, what, what they actually say is uh, where we can't extend possibility, actuality, and necessity. For example, we can't uh, ask whether of if I'm thinking of something and it involves no contradiction, um, 
but uh, uh, it's not a possible object of experience. You might think I could ask, okay, is this thing possible? Um, and if it's possible, is it not merely possible, but it is actual? And if it's not, and if it is actual, is it not merely actual, but necessary? So like those steps are part of a proof of the existence and necessity of God, <laughs> as we'll see. And, but these postulates already make that proof no good. Because they say that we don't know what possibility, actuality, or necessity means with respect to an object like that. That's not a possible object of experience. Um, okay, so, like, I mean, I think this is a place from which I could go on to make all kinds of observations about the structure of this system and, um, um, and whatever. And that's actually exactly what I, what I'm most, what I most like to do with this book whenever I can. Um, it's, uh, um, I think, I feel like a lot of readers have caught, have felt that the systematic nature of it is annoying, in fact. Like, let's just talk about the arguments um, and whether they're good or not. Um, and uh, I guess I, I feel almost the opposite. Like, the individual arguments may or may not be very convincing. It's the system that they're put together into that makes the interesting <laughs> right it's the way you keep seeing this pattern come up over and over again and in, in that way it's it's like it's i could say it's an anticipation of hegel but i think it'd be better to say hegel actually found a lot of hegel already in kant right <laughs> you know it, it didn't come from nowhere and uh and yet it has a lot of advantages over hegel <laughs> i think although i like hegel but um so, um, all right, so I could go on and on about this, but I'm not going to because I want to shift gears and talk about the details of the second analogy. Um, now, this is a place where I would stop and ask for questions. There's only two people virtually here, so I don't know if there's any point in that, but obviously ask a question if you have one. Um, I'm going to... Uh, And if you're watching the video and you have a question, you can ask a question in the comments. <laughs> um, okay, so the second analogy. So uh, um, why is it that I decided to focus the reading from the principles on the second analogy? Um, well, first of all, the second analogy is one of the most famous arguments in the book. It would be bad to skip it. Um, um, and moreover, there's at least one good reason why it's one of the most famous arguments in the book, namely that it's where Kant uh, takes on Hume head to head, right? Um, so... Uh, um, so if you're wondering who's right, Hume or Kant, or, I mean, or if you have a maybe more nuanced interest in the history of philosophy and you, you want to know how he, Kant is responding to Hume or whatever, uh, you know, this is really important to understand. Another reason I think it's famous, but this I'm not sure is such a good reason, is that it seems kind of clear what the argument is. Now, I mean, you might say, shouldn't it always seem kind of clear what the argument is? Like, isn't that what they teach us when they teach us how to write a philosophy paper, always make clear what the argument is? Well, um, 
I mean, I said a little bit before about why Kant is hard to understand, and I'll say more, I guess, when we get to the phenomena and noumena, but, um, um, or actually, no, we already read this, the thing about examples being the go-kart of judgment, right? That's in the introduction to the analytic of principles. Our examples are the go-kart of judgment. A go-kart is like a walker, you know, like if you have difficulty walking, then you lean on the go-kart and you push it along, right? So examples are the go-kart of judgment means that uh, um, if you don't have a good faculty of judgment, that is, if what if you're what is strictly speaking called stupid, <laughs> according to Kant, then uh, um, then you'll need examples to substitute for it. Right, because like you won't know how to apply general rules to cases, um, so you'll have to like look around for an example that's similar to this case. Um, um, but he says, therefore, of course, if you really want to understand the general principle, then it's bad to rely on the go kart. <laughs> you have to get rid of it. Right, so that's uh, that's um, uh, I mean, it's only a small. I, well, I don't know how small it is. It's an important part of the difficulty of the book that there aren't more examples. And at the beginning, he just apologized that he didn't have room for them. But it, in that place, he seems to say what I was claiming all along, which is that. A lot of the difficulty of the book is because Kant doesn't want it to be easy. Um, okay, well, you know, be that as it may, it's def it's it's true that the other arguments in the system of principles are much are mostly like it's really hard to understand what the argument is. And in the second analogy, it can seem like it's clear what the argument is. And so, of course, people have glommed onto it. <laughs> Right. I mean, uh, and the it seems like it's something about this. There has to be a universal causal order to phenomena if there's going to be an objective order in time. Right. It has something to do with that. Um, now, I mean, I don't think that's completely wrong, but I think that... Uh, the the way that seems to beckon to an easy to understand argument that you can then start building objections to is that that's really kind of a warning sign <laughs> right that i mean because i mean it either means what's going on in the second analogy is quite different that's what's going on in most of the other proofs which number one would be a bad thing for Kant, right? I mean, they're supposed to all be working out of the same highest principle. So, they, so like they should all somehow basically work the same way. Um, but also it would mean if it really is quite different from the other proofs, it would mean that what we can learn from it about Kant's view in general is limited so that this amount of attention to it wouldn't be warranted, right? Um, um, uh, so, so that that's one alternative, or the other alternative is it's not really different from the other proofs, and the easiness is merely apparent. That the the clarity or easiness of the argument. Now, I mean, if you read this, you're probably saying, "What clarity and easiness? I didn't understand what the hell he was talking about." <laughs> Maybe I should have assigned some of the others as contrast, but. Um, um, uh, but I mean. Hopefully, when you read about those boats going down the stream, if you got to that part, you, you started to think, oh, I guess he's saying, right. So I'm going to talk about what I think he's really saying. <laughs> um, um I do first.
Okay. So, so, um, so instead of talking right away about the time order and whatever, I'm going to start with something more basic. Um, experience. So we saw um, Kant say that experience is consists of connected perceptions. Um, but I don't think that's the definition of experience. I think the, the, the difference between experience and perception is that perception is um, by itself is a merely subjective state. Right, so like I'm perceiving red, I'm perceiving sweet, I'm perceiving, right? Like it's a state of my mind. Whereas in, so there's, as long as you're just thinking about perception, it's the best way to put this. To understand the nature of perceptions, you don't have to make a distinction between my state and the object that it refers to. Whereas experience is supposed to be um, a way of perceiving objects distinct from me. Um, So it's experience is the level, so to speak, at which we bring in the distinction between um, the uh, the object and the representation. So when we talk about empirical intuition, that is perceptions as um, representations of an object. Um, what we're thinking is, so here's me. <laughs> here's here's the manifold in sense, right? And now we're not talking about the manifold in pure sensibility, right? Like the fact that time is is plural, although it's also all one or something like that. We're talking about the manifold in perception, that is, that there's more than one sensation, <laughs> or that the sensations are, are different from each other, right? Um, and so when we talk about this somehow representing an object, um, what we're thinking is that in the object, And so re remember, object means the object of representation, <laughs> right? That is, I'm not just calling this object instead of a thing or a being in order to kind of like vary my speech or whatever. I'm calling it an object because we're thinking of it as something that I'm trying to refer to. And we're thinking that the thing that I'm trying to refer to or represent contains in itself a principle one principle, right, a unified principle that's responsible for this manifold in sensation. Um, and um, like what this responsibility is and what the object is like, um, we don't know, or that is, we do know, but we're forgetting about it, <laughs> right? Like we know in reality how objects affect our sense organs, how the objects of representation affect our sense organs and thereby cause us to have manifold sensations. 
but we only know all that stuff a posteriori. So we're forgetting about it for the purpose of transcendental philosophy. So all we so so all we know here is that somehow a principle of unity in the object of representation is supposed to be responsible for the manifold and sense. So um so how can I represent this object? Well, first of all, not by just just by having this manifold of sensations. Right? Because that doesn't represent the unity. That's just manifold. So, right, this again is why Pot said, um, on the one hand, a concept without intuition is no good, right? Because intuition is the immediate reference to the object. So the concept can never get to the object by itself. If we could get to the object by itself intellectually, we would be intuitive intellects and we wouldn't use concepts. And what would we use? We don't know. <laughs> All right. So, but... But on the other hand, he said, but the, the sensible intuition, the empirical intuitions by themselves also can't give an object. To have an object of representation, I must have a concept. And so basically, um, so the manifold in sense is also supposed to follow from my concept somehow. Now, I mean, as we know, like um, the imagination has to do something in between to make that happen. <laughs> um, but um, but just roughly speaking, like somehow the manifold in sense follows from my concept, right? Now, it follows from it, of course, in this case, not in the sense that my concept is responsible for the manifoldness. Again, then I would be an intuitive intellect. <laughs> but in the sense that the manifoldness, if it can, it can conform to my concept, it conforms to my concept if it's the kind that would follow from my concept as a rule. So this object is only going to be my object, that is the object of this concept, as applied to this, these sensations, if these sensations somehow set up an analogy between my rule and the object's rule. Um. And this is what the analogies of experience are going to require a priori, that that will be possible. Right? So, I mean, if you're in 100C, you should recognize here what I, my, what I said about what Locke means when he says that the ideas of primary qualities resemble the object, right? I said that resemblance there is a term for analogy. Um, and how, in Locke, how does this work? Well, so in Locke, it's supposed to work because there's visible necessary connections between these, between certain of them. The ones that represent primary qualities. If you're, if you're not in 100C, I, I guess, uh, Regard what I'm saying, or I don't know, maybe it'll still make sense, but um, right, like, so you know, the, the main example being that um, Locke says somehow we know that the thing that gives us the sensation, the idea, simple idea of solidity, as he puts it, um, 
is such that it won't allow anything else into its place. Um, and there, that's that's what allows it to push other bodies out of their place and so forth, right? So, like we see it, can we see a necessary connection between the simple idea of solidity and some other ideas, which are not at all the same, right? That is, this is what Kant would call synthetic. These other ideas are ideas of bodies moving and not moving into the same space and whatever, right? Whereas this is just like a sensation, according to Locke, like red. <laughs> and yet we see a necessary connection between them. So because of the necessary connection that there is between those primary qualities, according to Locke, um, we know that there's an analogy between the order of ideas and something about the structure of the object. So, I mean, I think up to a point, Kant agrees with that, except he also agrees with Barclay and Hume that this thought of a necessary connection, a visible necessary connection between the ideas makes no sense. That necessity is of connection is not something that could be given to me. Ray, I, I can only represent a necessity by having a rule in myself not by having something happen to me. That's like the fundamental reason, I think, why Barclay and Hume reject this. And it's definitely the reason why Kant rejects it. Um, like, that this necessarily comes together with this is not a way I could be affected. Rather, it's something I could demand. Um, so the only way of representing necessity is by having a rule of my own. Um, So I have this rule of my own, but now the question is, why think that there's any analogy between my rule and the rule and the object, right? And Hume says, why think that? No good reason, <laughs> right? So Kant wants to say, no, it's a priori certain. <laughs> um. So like, this is obvious about the analogies overall, not just about the second analogy. Um, but, um, but when we ask, um, like specifically, what kind of an analogy does there have to be here? So what we're asking is, that is, what can we know a priori must be present, right? Like, so for, for example, like I can't know a priori that there's something in the object analogous to my concept of cinnabar. I only know that there is cinnabar a posteriori. And I guess you could say, moreover, I'm not absolutely certain there is cinnabar, although Kant doesn't, um, talk about that so much in the case of empirical concepts as opposed to empirical judgments. But the truth is, like, no matter how much experience I think I've formed my concept of cinnabar based on, I could have been doing it wrong. <laughs> um, this is what I think I mentioned the example of phlogiston earlier in the course as an empirical concept that turned out not to be empirical. Um, so, um, uh, and maybe that's actually, that's the rule rather than the exception, but the, the, that science comes up with empirical concepts, which then in the end turn out not quite to work. And that's how we make progress, right? But, um, but, but so anyway, that what's clear is that I don't know that analogy a priori. 
So like, what is it that I can be argued to know a priori? And it's what I can be argued to know a priori is that um, um, the fundamental capabilities that are necessary to form empirical concepts have some application. Right, and I mean, of course, that's exactly what we argued in the deduction, <laughs> the transcendental deduction. Right. So again, we're just getting down to the specifics of that here. And here we're talking which capabilities we're we talking about, the ones that are about relation, right? The quality of relation. And in particular, they're about the relation of perceptions to other perceptions. At this, at, or I mean, that's how they're going to be imaged by the imagination. <laughs> right. So um, so it's the categories of relation. So what we have to, what, what all we're trying to show is that the object contains some analog of the, um, um, of the categories of relation. And, um, um, and now we have to bring the imagination back in to understand what that means. That is, we need to show that the object must be such as to cause a manifold in me that the imagination can synthesize as an image of a concept that among other things represents its object as substance and accident, cause and effect, and as part of community. Um, and the the way the imagination so so like what does what do we have to work with in describing what the imagination has to be able to do? Well, just the form of inner sense time, right? So we're going to try to explain what uh, um, what time relations there must be between the effects of the object on me. Because those time relations must exist if the imagination is going to be able to synthesize the object's effects on me as image of an empirical concept. So, um, and so again, the first analogy, the analogy of substance, um, but the, the category of substance and accident that we're talking about um, that is, that's one of our capabilities of forming an empirical concept um, is, um, and it's the function of the understanding and categorical judgment, right? So remember, a categorical judgment is A is B as opposed to a hypothetical judgment, which is So the function of the understanding in categorical judgment. Now, I mean, this is also a universal judgment. It's also an affirmative judgment, right? Remember, those things are not exclusive. They're right, like you have to pick one of each, so to speak. But when we focus on the fact that this is a categorical judgment, what we're focusing on the fact is that the condition on which the rule applies is internal to the subject as a judgment.
right? So like what the category is asking for, so to speak, is that um, um, whatever is predicated of this object uh, has to depend on a condition that's internal to the object and that remains identical th through all those predications. Maybe I shouldn't say remains because that's bringing in, might sound like it's bringing in time there, that is identical across all predications, right? There's some internal condition of the object um, that um, by virtue of which all these predications apply to it. I mean, that condition is not going to be sufficient, right? It's going to be necessary and not sufficient, right? Because because for as as the object state changes, going back to the time version of it, right? That means that you know um, something external to the nature of the object must have caused that change. Right, because the object, because the principle of the identical principle in the object we're talking about remains the same, so it can't be responsible for the change. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, the, the the state before and after the change both depend on the nature of the object itself. Um, that right, so that's what we're doing, and so what um, the way the imagination images that so to speak, is that everything that happens is an alteration of something permanent. Right, so alteration means change in, in quality. This is an Aristotelian term that Kant uses in the more or less traditional sense here. It's a change in quality, except of course, we've proved in the anticipations of perception that qualities are matters of intensive quantity, right? So this is the change in the quantity in the degree of some state of the substance, the sub whereas the substance remains the same. And so, the, the first analogy shows that, like, um, um, what I perceive must consist of events. That is, it must co consist of changes in quality of permanent substances. must consist of alterations. Um, so now when we get to the uh, beginning of um, this, I guess this is the beginning of the second analogy. This is the beginning of the third analogy. Oh, no way, I have it backwards. <laughs> All right. Yeah, here we go. The preceding principle has shown that all appearances of succession in time are one and all alterations, that is, a successive being and not being of the determinations of a substance which abides. Right? That's the summary of what we've shown in the first analogy. And therefore, we're taking that for granted in the statement of the second analogy. All alterations take place in conformity with the law of connection of cause and effect, right? What needs to be explained are events, and events are alterations, that is, change in states of substances, 
Um, and um, so this is important. This order of perceptions um, is not itself the order of cause and effect. This is the order of effects. Right? It's, the, it's what causes perceptions is change in state of the objects. And the change in states of the objects are the effects. So the order of perception is the order of effects. The cause, Kant says, is always a substance. Now, I mean, it's not the same substance or not the same part of substance or um, that's being effect that's being that's changing its state, or at least not the same one regarded the same way, or something like that, right? It's another substance or another part of substance that's acting on this one to change its states. And as it changes states, it becomes capable of changing, of causing different perceptions in me. And so, right, like if here's the cause, the cause, and as you get into the second analogy, Kant says that um, all causes really act continuously. Right, they don't, you shouldn't think of cause on the model of a billiard ball hitting another billiard ball. I mean, I guess because even if you looked carefully at what happens when one billiard ball hits another billiard ball, it doesn't really happen in an instant, right? There's some period of time, however short, in which they continuous, the balls continuously act on each other before they separate. Um, so, right, so this cause is acting on this substance. Now, this substance itself is not the effect, right? Because this cause doesn't change the, cause the substance to be different, to be a different substance, right? The first analogy proved that substance doesn't change. The quantity of substance doesn't change, right? But the, it's causing the this substance's... Um, modes or states to change. And again, you can think of um, a body changing its state of motion. So now when we talk about the boats going down the stream, I guess it's, I always think it's boats, but I think actually it's only one boat. Yeah, when you think of a boat going down the stream, um, so here's the boat at one time, here's the boat at a later time. What is the cause and what's the effect here? Um, well, first of all, like strictly speaking, moving to one place to another at a constant velocity is um, something that Kant himself uh, um, wouldn't count as a change of state. But I wrote down this year where this footnote is where he said that. I'm always hunting for it. Oh, yeah, here it is. It should be carefully noted that I speak not of the alteration of certain relations in general, but of alteration of state. Thus, when a body moves uniformly, it does not in any way alter its state of motion. That occurs only when its motion increases or diminishes. This is something Kant understands about Newtonian mechanics that um, 
a lot of other people, even later people like John Stuart Mill, don't seem to understand. Maybe I should say that I agree with Kant and disagree with them about Newtonian mechanics. I'm not sure, but anyway, right, that that uh, Newtonian mechanics doesn't explain motion; it explains acceleration. Motion is taken not to need explanation. Right, a body in motion remains in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. So, um, so the effect actually, the effect here is not really the boat moving from here to here. What is the effect? Well, um, I mean, suppose the boat were on a flat lake and you gave it a push. So it would move for a while, but it would get slower and slower, and eventually it would stop. Because the water would make it stop. Right? Friction with the water would make it stop. So why doesn't the boat going down the stream stop? Well, it's because something continuously pushes it. What pushes it? It's this big substance over here, the earth, that's acting on it continuously. <laughs> I guess I should draw it this way, right? It's, I mean, it's it's a little hard to see this because the water is there, but, you know, but the water, so the water is doing two things to the boat. Number one, it's keeping it from accelerating much faster towards the center of the earth, right? If you took the water away, the boat would, would like accelerate right away towards the center of the earth until it smashed down on the bottom, right? So, um, so the water is acting, you know, like this way, vertically on the boat. That's not moving it this way. Um, and the water is acting this way on the boat. It's slowing it down, just like it would have when it was in the lake. Um, The earth is pulling the boat down. <laughs> That's the right way, because obviously the resultant has to be this way. Well, no, I mean, Right, and this force that the water exerts um, gets stronger and stronger as the boat moves faster. I guess the buoyancy force is actually perpendicular to the water that way. I'll make it come out right anyway. <laughs> I'm going to say that, right? So the result of these forces is pointing down the river. Right? That's why, like, if instead of a river, this were ice, <laughs> the boat would just slide down. <laughs> it would get faster and faster. And if we're, instead of ice, it were a frictionless plane, it would keep going faster and faster and faster. <laughs> right? Because it's water, it keeps going faster until it gets to a speed where this force this way balances out that one, and then it just floats down at that speed. <laughs> right. So, um, um, so the, the cause that's acting on the boat is, um, as we expect, it's another substance that acts continuously to change its state. And it's, you know, it's confusing because it causes an it causes an acceleration, which we don't actually see because it's balanced out by another acceleration, 
but that's that is the way Kant thinks about these things. Um, you can see that from, even from like his early paper on negative magnitudes, um, where he, like he talks about uh, again, it's a boat on the water, but he's saying the current is moving it one way and the wind is moving it the other way, and therefore it stands still. Um, so he's like each one is causing a motion, and the two motions cancel each other out. So I think the effect here actually is the acceleration, which is canceled out by the other acceleration. That's that's the effect that the Earth is having on the boat. Um, okay, so like, I don't know, was it important to go through all of that or not? I think it is important just to rule out so, and even if the details of the way I said it aren't exactly right, which I'm starting to worry, maybe they're not. But um, I, what I want to rule out is that the idea that the that this is the cause, and this is the effect, right? So that when we that when Kant says that like. Um, it's because of the law of cause and effect that you can only that you can only see the boat up the stream first and then down the stream and not vice versa. The temptation is to think, oh, the cause has to be before the effect, and then to think of this as the cause, but this is not the cause of that effect, <laughs> right? Um, it's rather everything that's happening to the boat here is the effect. <laughs> Okay. Um, oh my, I've already gone over time. I got so into it. Oh, that is bad. I guess maybe I will talk a little bit next time about how the argument of the second analogy actually works. <laughs> but um, all right, I will see you then, I guess. And uh, um. And I do hope it will be in person. I guess stay tuned to your email. Um, it's It seems, I think it didn't affect this class. It seems like maybe some people didn't, never got the email that I sent on yesterday, whatever day that was. So anyway, I'll try to make sure that doesn't happen again. Uh, and, you know, stay tuned to your email. Uh, you know, it will depend if camp if it seems like campus is accessible and safe then i'll definitely come in and teach in person uh um but if not obviously i won't so um we'll see okay thank you see you later bye